Kia ora everybody! Good morning, my name's Anna and welcome this morning. I'm from the Knight community. I'm Hattie and I'm also from the Knight community. Fancy that. <laughs> <laughs> um, today we are going to be going through chapter two of Habakkuk. Um, we're also going to be having a time of worship together um, and having communion together. So mm. It's going to be good. It's going to be awesome. And stick around to the end of the service because we have a whole church update from Simon, Jenny, and um, the lead pastor of City, Jerem. So make sure you stick around till the end. And we've got so many things to celebrate within our church community at the moment. We do. We've got some awesome things. Um, first thing is Josh and Amy Billet have just had a wee baby called Freya Billet. Mm. Um, she was born late on Sunday, I believe. So cute. They're she is. So congratulations guys, they are part of ACE, they lead a life group out there. Um, and we're also going to be celebrating the engagement of Wei-Yan and Andrew. So they're part of um, the city community. Um, yeah, they're an awesome couple. So congratulations guys, that's super exciting. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, another thing we're celebrating is at the start of the year, um, we started grouping the uni life groups together and having these things called uni community nights. And we're just celebrating the um, what's the right word, like fruit from it and the momentum that they're getting. A couple of weeks ago they had a community night at the ASB and just this week they cooked all these lasagnas and did their lasagna ministry again and we just wanted to celebrate what God's doing there mm. and also celebrate Tyler Scott who is an um, intern with the street night who mm. is leading that all. She's doing such a good job. And the last thing we want to celebrate is we want to celebrate and spend some time honouring May and Stephen Heron. Um, they have discipled so many of the kids within our church through leading at Kids Street, when it was called Kids Street, so it's pre-Kids Zone, and Little Lights. Mm. Um, those are the young ones under five. They've been involved in discipling kids for ages, and um, more recently they have um, lead a young adults life group and next week they moved to London for a couple of years for May's work and so we want to spend we want to honor them today and we also wanted to encourage everybody to be praying for them mm. um, for the move for finding a new church community and also um, praying for their kids in England that they're going to disciple because they're so gifted at it so mm. yeah we want to spend some time honoring them yeah so cool um, we're going to head into our time of worship now um, yeah, I've just been thinking um, today and this week about how incredible it is that we can worship um, this God who yeah. created um, the universe, who created the mountains and the oceans, um, but who also created us and knows us so incredibly deeply um, mm. and loves us so much, um, loves us so much that he died on the cross um, to, to save us. Um, so yeah, I just love to pray for this time of worship. Um, yeah, let's pray. Mm. Father God, we, um, yeah, we just lift this time up to you right now, Father. Mm. Would you be blessed through our praise and worship to you, God, um, with the words of the songs that we sing, just mm. honour you. Um, and God, would they go straight into our hearts? Mm. Um, would we know that that's, that's truth, Father? Yes, um, Lord. Your gospel is truth. Yeah, Father, would, um, yeah, would everything that has breath praise the Lord, God, no matter who we are, um, would we just use this time to praise you, Father? Mm, thank you, Lord. Yeah, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. So wherever you are right now, you might be in a home or whether you're at one of the local gatherings, why don't you stand and we're going to sing together. Slave for 
For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Yeah, every knee will bow before the Lamb. Open up the gates. He's here to save the cat.
Waiting is hard. You know, we'd give anything for a fast track on patience, wouldn't we? And I think it's even harder when the one we're waiting on is God. When we think we know what we want him to do and we think he really, really should do it and yet he just doesn't seem to be coming through. Today, what I want to explore with you, with us, is this, uh, what it looks like to trust in God's timing. And I don't want to just do what seems to be so prevalent these days and sort of share three top tips for like waiting well. I want, to, I want to ground what I say in an ancient text, a conversation that a man, a prophet of Judah had, a conversation he had with God and, and, and the conclusions he came to. And so as we do that, I think we're going to come to a richer, deeper, more lasting understanding of what it means to wait well Today And so if you've got a Bible, turn to Habakkuk uh, t- chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole passage. Um, and, and just as you turn there, last week Anna took us through uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. And the time is around 609 BC. And you might not care about that. But if you know your history, that timing is really, really significant. Because just around the corner is a really dark time for Judah. King Rehoboam is on the throne. He is an awful king. And the, and the nation is filled with injustice. And Habakkuk sees this and he's like, God, when are you going to do something about injustice? And God says, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to come and judge uh, Israel. And he's like, what? That's an awful answer to my prayer. Like, they're really, really bad. How are you going to do that? And yet he, he comes to this place of saying, but God, I trust you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look and I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what you will say to me. And so it's the response that God now brings to Habakkuk's sort of posture of trust towards God that we're going to read about now. And what we learn is that God is saying, at some point, I am going to punish Babylon. And this season you're about to go through Judah, this is for you to be disciplined. But one day I'm going to get rid of Babylon altogether. So turn with me. We're going to go Habakkuk 2 and we're going to read this together. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits at appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove, prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that they are peoples, the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone. Wake up. Can he give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, 
There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth fall silent before him. I want to just say a few things to help us sort of understand what we just read. And there are three things I want us to take out of this passage. The first is that there's an appointed time. Verse 2, um, it says, you know, the Lord replied, write down the revelation, make it plain so someone can run with it. God's saying, I'm about to reveal something to you, Habakkuk. And, and I want you to write it down and make it plain so that people can understand it. And it says, for the revelation what awaits an appointed Time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. The revelation that God is speaking of to Habakkuk is about something that will happen in future. And it's going to be slightly delayed. It's not going to happen right away. But God wants to make sure Habakkuk knows, even though there's a delay, it will certainly come. God is promising that this outcome for Babylon will come about. So there's an appointed time. The second thing I want us to see in this passage is the righteous will live by faith or his faithfulness. The Babylonians are puffed up. They're characterized by arrogance and pride and their wicked desires never seem to be enough. You know, they just want to conquer city after city and land after land. This desire to just spread out will never ever be satisfied. But in contrast, contrast to that pride, God says, my people are going to live by my faithfulness. Now, the translation of this verse is pretty hard because you can see it says, we'll live by his faithfulness, and yet the alternative way of translating it is that they will live by faith. And, and, but actually, it doesn't really matter. that There's sort of these two, the, these two views because the two come together in something wonderful. Think about it in this way. When there's an earthquake, one of the things we're told to do is sort of like maybe scramble under a, a, a sturdy table. And the reason we do that is because the table is strong. But there's no point in diving under it if the table isn't strong enough, if it isn't trustworthy, if it isn't faithful, right? But the, but the table can be as strong as you want it to be, but if you never step under it, if you never put your faith in it, then what point is it in, being it, in it being strong enough? And so there's something about the faithfulness of the table and the trust in the faithfulness of the table that, that, that bring together this idea of faith. And what, what God is saying is, I am faithful I am trustworthy, and what you need to do is put your trust in me. That is how I want you to live. That is the definition of trust. And this concept is so important. I said it's about 609 BC. Between 605 and 586, Judah is about to be invaded three sep on three separate occasions by King Nebuchadnezzar. And each time, he'll carry more and more people away uh, to Babylon. This was like Babylon's way. They conquered new nations, and then they took like the rich, the wealthy, the people of status, and they took them back to Babylon so that it was much easier for them to control their empire. And so they're about to go through it. Like Judah is about to go through a really awful time as they're taken like 1,500 kilometers away from home. And they're going to be in exile for about 70 years. And God wants them to know, though this is going to happen, there is an appointed time in future where I am going to bring you home. I am faithful to bring this about. I will judge Babylon one day. And so in all that is about to happen, the invasions and the exile and the time you're going to spend away, trust me, I'm going to deal with Babylon and I will bring you home. Put your trust in my faithfulness. Here's the third thing I want you to see in this passage. This is not how it ends. In verse 6, it sort of turns, and you might have caught it. It says, will not all of them uh, taunt him with ridicule? The them is the victims, the Judah, the people who are going to be invaded, and the him is Babylon. And what it's saying is the victims, if God's going to turn the tables, the victims are actually going to rejoice. They're going to celebrate. They're going to taunt over Babylon. And so the point being made is that this is not how it ends. And what comes from there, you might have heard me read again and again the word woe. And it sort of comes in these five poems or sort of funeral songs. And what God is saying is that the people of Judah are one day going to be able to sing these songs over Babylon when God deals with that nations. And the first three uh, talk about things like, you know, God's going to judge them for them killing innocent people and, and building their empire through injustice. But in the middle of that, 
we get this wonderful glimpse of what God is going to do at a point in the future. It says this, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Though Babylon has been like, so, like um, merciless in the way that they have spread out, there's only far that, so far that they can go because there is a day coming. There is an appointed time when the, when the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Have you ever seen ocean without water on it? God's saying there won't be a square inch of the whole world where it is not filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. The fourth and fifth song in this sort of funeral, uh, funeral sort of songs talk about the, the, the glory of Babylon being turned to disgrace and, and the fact that they've relied on false gods and those gods are going to be proved worthless God is going to turn the table and he is going to bring judgment upon Babylon. And so it finishes with this verse, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth fall silent before him. Silence is something that happens in scripture in the face of God's judgment. When the holiness of God is revealed over sin and God deals with it fully and finally, all people can do is stand in awestruck silence at the holiness of God. And so that's what this chapter means to the original readers. There's an appointed time. This is not how it ends. And in the meantime, my people are to trust in my faithfulness. But I want you to see in this passage, there's actually something bigger going on. There's this idea of double fulfillment. You might have heard of it. And I want you to imagine that you're sort of painting a picture of a mountain range. And you can see a peak in the distance, and there's a bigger peak behind it. And in one picture, you're painting both mountains. And that's what's going on here. Um, Habakkuk, I forgot his name for a moment. Habakkuk is talking about something that happened in the 6th century. But at the same time, he's glimpsing something that's going to go on in the future, an ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. You know, we come at this text knowing that, knowing about Jesus, knowing that the Son of God took on flesh, lived perfectly, died the death we deserved uh, in our place, rose again and, and, and ascended into heaven. And we know that one day he is coming again. And just like Habakkuk taught that in future there is an appointed time, so Jesus also taught in his time there is an appointed time in the future known to the Father. When he is going to come, when Jesus is going to come again. And prior to that time, there's this time of judgment on the earth. There's this time of tribulation where God's wrath is poured out. And so in the New Testament, it's like the, the old empire of Babylon becomes this metaphor. This, it's a foreshadowing of a future Babylon. Just as the old Babylon was known for immorality and idolatry and, and injustice, so there's a future, so Revelation speaks of a future Babylon that is characterized by the same uh, things. It's this ultimate expression of rebellion against God in the world. And just as Babylon's conquering was turned on its own head, just as the sort of punishment they dealt out came upon their own head, so Revelation in chapter 17 and 18 speaks of a time when the ultimate Babylon will be judged. You can, in fact, if you read Revelation 17 and 18 and, and compare it to Habakkuk 2, they are such similar passages. And, 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 and so uh, at the climax of that, you get this moment in, just as there's silence at the climax of this judgment over old Babylon, on. So in future, there's silence in heaven as the climax of God's judgment on the earth comes to pass. And all heaven just stands in silence at the revelation of the holiness of God on the earth. Just as Habakkuk's prophecy spoke of um, Babylon's defeat and the people of God rejoicing over that defeat. So all of heaven will one day celebrate, and you read about it in Revelation 19, will celebrate over the destruction of the ultimate Babylon, over the time when God's judgment is poured out on the injustice we see in our world. And just as Habakkuk foresaw a day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea, so there is an ultimate day 
when Jesus Christ returns after that period of tribulation. It's called the millennium, and he's going to reign on David's throne for a thousand years. He's going to rule and reign in absolute supremacy. There won't be an inch of earth that is not aware of the fullness of the glory of God, and we on earth will experience what it's like to live under the rule and reign of a good and powerful king. It will be an incredible day. These days are coming. And that's what Habakkuk is ultimately leading us towards. And so I want to ask us, if that's what it means, if that's what it means, how should we live today? I think the point is that Babylon is everywhere. Sin and death is like this global empire. The whole earth is subject to the consequences of rebellion against God. We're afflicted by it and affected by sin in every way. You and I cannot imagine a world without sin and injustice. And as we go through crises, as we go through difficulty, as we find ourselves crying out to God to do something in our day, we're reminded that 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 all of the pain we experience ultimately derives from sin and rebellion against God. And we cry out like we read Habakkuk did in verse 7. How long, O oh Lord, how long? When we hear news of war, when we read stories of children being trafficked, when we see of wider injustice, when we read of uh, corrupt governments, when we're confronted by hunger and poverty, we cry out, how long until that appointed time, Lord? How long? When we walk through sickness, mental illness, trauma, bereavement, uh, miscarriage, inf infidelity, infertility, we cry out, how long, oh Lord, how long? When we're faced with sin in our own lives and we feel stuck and, and in bondage and, and in shackles and we just want to break free we're crying out how long oh lord how long and here's what i think we can take from habakkuk number one there's an appointed time there is a time coming when this will end when god will deal with injustice and there's something that helps us when we know that there's there's an appointed time Think of it in this way, like, you know, if you ever order something online and you begin tracking, you know, on, on your phone maybe, like, uh, when it's coming. You know, I ordered something recently from Australia, and it's like, it's in Melbourne. I'm like, okay, cool, that's not too far away. And it's like, then it's in Australia. I'm like, well, that's more vague. Like, when's it coming? And then finally, like, the immortal words are expressed on your phone, right? With Korea. Like, it's a marvelous time, you know? And then you're like, but when's it coming? Is it like this morning? Is it lunchtime? Is it end of the day? I, I don't know. But, but the courier knows. And there's something about me on that day that relaxes. I'm like, it's with the courier. He or she has got it. Like, it's, I, I, it's not quite maybe when I want it to be. I still don't quite know. But no, it's coming today. There's something that shifts when we know there's an appointed time. There's something that shifts when we know it's actually coming. And I think that's something that God is leading us to understand here. That as we walk through these crises, as we're faced with these difficulties, there's something different in our posture when we understand there's an appointed time. That God will deal with it. And I think this is what Paul picks up when he refers to this idea in, in, in Hebrews 10. You know, it's talking to the persecuted church and it says, Hebrews 10, 34, you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew you, you yourselves, um, <laughs> you yourselves, that sounded funny, had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a little while. These are Habakkuk's words. He who is coming will not delay. This is an appointed time. And when we suffer, when we're persecuted, when we're challenged, God wants the community of the church to be like the, the writer to Hebrews, to say to one another, I know you're struggling, but there's a day coming. I know you're struggling, but it is coming. It's like it's with the courier. Okay, it's going to be here soon. Hang on. Don't throw away your faith. Don't give up. Don't shipwreck your confidence. Keep going because at an appointed time. And God knows when it is. Can we put our trust in him today? I think the other thing Habakkuk wants us to take away from this, and the Lord would have us take away from this passage, is this is not how it ends. You know, Habakkuk teaches us that when you feel the pain of injustice, and when you're grieved with suffering, there's something that goes on in our hearts in that moment that is like in tune with the heart of God. He's not indifferent to suffering. It's not that he doesn't care, even though it seems like, like, why aren't you dealing with it now? There's something in us 
that resonates with the heart of God when, we, when, we, when we're grieved over injustice. And we have to remember that this is not how it ends. God will deal with the injustice one day. And Jesus really is coming again. And so I think the pain and suffering are this invitation for us to look to Jesus. This sort of invitation to look for and long for the, the reign of Jesus that is coming. I have a friend who's been in hospital recently. He's got a degenerative brain condition. He's a friend of many of us called Ewart. And I've got nothing to offer him except when I go and see him to hold his arm and say, this is not how it ends. This is not how it ends. Degenerative diseases are not the end for you and they're not the end for me because there is an appointed time. This is not how it ends. He is coming again. He is coming again. And finally, I think for us, there is this call to walk by faith. Paul picks this up a couple of times in the New Testament, in Romans, and Galatians. In Galatians, he picks it up because the Galatians had started believing in Jesus and then they walked away from it. Or, they were, or rather, they began to hedge their bets. They're like, we believe in Jesus, but maybe we should also do some things for the, with the law because we want to just make sure that we're right with God. And Paul's like, whoa, it's his most aggressive letter. He's like, you, you foolish Galatians, this is outrageous. Come back to a simple trust in Christ. Don't trust yourselves. Don't trust your strength. Don't trust what you think you can achieve. Just strip that all away and come back to a simple trust in Jesus. And I think this is a call for us today out of Habakkuk, that the righteous, that the people of God are to walk, to trust in the faithfulness of God. You know, these last two years have had such a profound impact on the church and many people have drifted away and many people have just uh, have sort of walked away from their faith all together. And I think part of the challenge for us is that our faith was too easily tied to a form of church. And when that went away and maybe we were meeting online or meeting at home, it's suddenly like my faith was in a meeting, a meeting place and now that's not there. I don't know what that's doing to me. I don't know where I am now. And I think there is this call for us today, come, just come back to Jesus. Just come back to him. Just come back to the one who's going to rule and reign one day. Just come back to the one who died for you. Come back to the one who rose again. Just come back to a simple, childlike trust in Jesus. You know, for some of us, the journey is just hard. Maybe the stakes got raised for you in the workplace recently, and that's what you're crying out to God for right now. Can I invite you just to come back to a simple trust in Jesus? Maybe trauma happened. Maybe sickness happened. Maybe doubt creeped in. You know, you were sure of your faith and then doubt has creeped in. And you've got questions. Can I encourage you? Come back to Jesus first. And just sort of don't ignore the doubts, but bring them to Jesus and say, Lord, bring me back to just a simple trust in you. Maybe you're looking at the pain and injustice in the world and you're like, how can a good God tolerate this? The answer is he doesn't. He just hasn't dealt with it fully and finally yet. But would you trust the one who took your sin and the weight of the world's sin upon his own shoulders for your sake and just come back to a simple trust in him and say, Lord, I don't have all the answers. I don't really know how this all turns out, but I'm going to trust you today that there's an appointed time and the evil that grieves me is not how it is. Ends. One day you're coming again. And so today, today I come back to you again and simply bring a simple faith in you. I think this is how we wait well. It's not three top tips. It's grounded in an ancient conversation with God, but I think it's richer for that reason. This is how we wait well. It's a hope in the future that God will bring about, and it's a trust in the faithfulness of God today, and it's a trust in the most faithful one of all, Jesus. God, I pray today that you would bring us again to a simple trust in you. And whatever is going on in our lives, whatever's going on in our world, whatever maybe has caused us to drift from this simplicity, bring us back to a simple trust today, I pray. Lord, for anybody right now just struggling in that way, thank you that we can turn to you right now and just come with those issues, come with those problems, say, I just return to Jesus. And as part of that expression, Lord, we, 
we turn our hearts and our attention towards you in worship. We declare the greatness and the faithfulness of God in the Psalms that we sing. And in this moment, I pray as we sing, let this be a moment of recommitment and reconnection and an expression of our simple trust in Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Simon was closing there. I said these words of a song go through my mind. And just before we sing this next one, I'll sing it. It's really simple. It's just a song of surrendering to the Lord. And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you, all to you. Just come before Him and surrender your life. And I, and I.
plan, Lord. There's an appointed time where you're coming back, Lord. Um, I thank you, Lord, that that's something we can trust wholeheartedly, Lord. Um, and Lord, today I pray for um, people who feel conviction from you today. Um, I pray for people who, who, who just want to reach out to you and accept you into their lives, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your leading. We thank you that you um, are faithful. We thank you, Lord, that you you know everything, Lord. We give it all to you. Amen. I just had on my heart as we were singing then, um, it's not like a fully formed thought yet, so have grace for me, of like when Simon talked about that Babylon, the Babylon is like this group of people that are the ultimate rebellion against God. And um, kind of the thing that God stirred in me was, if you feel like you're part of that, if you feel this like, oh wow, I feel like I'm I'm so part of the way of the world and this sin against God, um, the only thing between you being there and between you not being part of that is accepting Jesus into your heart and he absolutely, he, he absolutely is there to be accepted. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to kind of make a point of that, of if that was something that stood in your heart of, I'm part of that. Mm. I don't want to be part of that. Um, I urge you, if you know anyone that, that loves Jesus, um, if you've got a friend at work or however you got onto watching this service, ask them what their story is. Mm. Ask them what they love about Jesus, who Jesus is. Um, or email office at the street and we would love to connect with you and introduce you more to who Jesus is. Mm. Um, but what we are going to do now is we're going to take, um, take some time to share communion together. And I was reflecting this morning on... Um, sometimes in my head, I kind of use the words communion and bread and juice time synonymously, and that's so wrong. It's so not about this, like, um, part of the service where now we share the bread and juice. Mm. So not part of that. What it is, is it's gathering as as people who mm. want to come before the Lord, and it's about remembering this ultimate sacrificial love of Jesus mm. and doing that every time we gather until that appointed time of when he comes back. Mm. So even if you don't have bread and juice, like that's secondary. If you've got chocolate milk and like yeah. wheat bix, <laughs> like that's fine. The point is we gather and we remember um, that Jesus came, he died on the cross and he's mm. coming back mm. and, we, and we celebrate and we pray for one another and we pray for that endurance from the now to when he comes back that we can live in that faithfulness. So um, if you're watching with people together, um, I encourage you to pause and I encourage you to spend some time praying with each other. Um, we're going to have another song of worship, so kind of dip into that whenever you're ready. Um, so yeah, share communion together.
um, how beautiful it is to, to praise you, God, mm. and to hear from your word. Thank you, Father, that, um, that you care so much for us, that there is an end point to the suffering and pain that we, that we may experience here on earth, God. Thank you so much for that, Father. Um, thank you that you are faithful, God. We can trust you mm. because you are faithful. Yeah, thank you so much, God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. That was mm. awesome. And um, next week we're in Habakkuk 3, so have a read of that before. I totally encourage you, even do SOAP. That's a way to study the Bible. Mm. Read the scripture, write down anything that you notice. Um, that's the observe part. Then how does this apply to my life? And then pray for those things. Um, so that's next week. But before that, um, we have a church update from Simon, Jenny, and Jerem. So here you go. Kia ora. We are now almost four months down the road since our Vision Sunday. And so now is a good time for us to give an update on where things are at. If you're new to the street church, we are one church that has met in three locations, City, East and Night. East and Night have, over the last few months, continued to meet in their usual venues, um, Night in small and large gatherings and um, East in Miramar. But our City location has experienced some major changes. Leading up to Vision Sunday um, in early May, you may remember that City had been meeting in smaller gatherings right across the Wellington region. And we really sensed with the elders that the Lord may be showing us a better way to launch new locations. Mm. And since then, City has been meeting in local services every week in our buildings in Mount Victoria, as well as in the Hutt Valley, in Porirua and in Kurori, which we're calling West. So, Jeremy, I wonder, could you tell us what's been going on since then? Yeah, totally. It's been a truly amazing couple of months uh, seeing the way these uh, gatherings are, are, are thriving um, it, and obviously don't, doesn't come without its challenges, right, when you take mm. a congregation and, yeah. and you ask them to change how they gather. But I think one of the things that, that comes to mind the most is this phrase, this refrain I hear so often from people is that, I've never felt so connected to church in my wow. life. Wow. Never felt so connected to the people mm. that I'm that I'm worshiping with, and that for us is just a massive win, right? Mm. A place where people can gather and come and be known. Mm. And I think largely that's because of uh, the the people are gathering locally with people in their neighbourhoods. You know, realizing that um, they're meeting people that they've worshipped with for years, but didn't know they were down the road. Yeah. Uh, but also in the smaller settings, you know, when you not have three, four hundred people in one place, uh, but 60 to 100, you see the same people, you talk to the same people yeah. week after week, yeah. and that just helps strengthen those connections. Yeah. Uh, I think shared lunches, you know, it's a really simple thing, but it's been a really profound thing, I think, for mm. our services. Uh, chances for people to hang around afterwards share a meal and get to know one another. I think particularly at Mount Victoria, that's been a really big part of it because uh, it just hasn't been able to be done before. Yeah. There's yeah. so many uh, people remember the 9 and the 11 a.m. Mm. 9 o'clockers had to clear out, get out of the car park so the 11 o'clockers could Make come way in. For the others. Yeah, there was yeah. just no room. Uh, but now there is. And a couple of weeks ago at the last year lunch, I had to kick people out of the building <laughs> so I could get home and see my family. Yeah, no, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Mm. Uh, in the Hutt Valley, uh, we're seeing overflow already from the connections that are being made to other discipleship opportunities. Mm. Uh, there's a group of guys that are meeting to go through systematic theology with Bryce Williams, and that has come as a result of the connection and relationships that have been built there. Mm. And, and Bryce's wife Liv doing the same with the Women's Mosaic Bible Study. Wow. So it's great seeing that next step. Yeah, uh, yeah it's truly wonderful. Uh, Potorua, we had a baptism service there a few weeks ago, which was just amazing, you know, celebrate baptisms for what they are. Yeah, 100%. But I had this, this uh, moment in the morning where I remembered what we'd discussed months and months ago before Vision Sunday, that we wanted to know that come August, middle of winter, dark, cold, <laughs> wet, windy morning, <laughs> would people still get up early yeah. to set up the chairs, to set up worship? Would they still have the enthusiasm and eagerness once the novelty had worn off? Yeah. And I got there early that morning, and it was an awful Wellington day. Yeah. But there were about a dozen people there just beaming. Wow. You know, there was no drudgery. It was just, you just looked at them and you could tell 
wow, they want to be here, mm. you know. Yeah. The, yeah. the sacrifice to get up early on an awful day, but they were, it was joyful. Mm. And, you know, I'm like, man, that is so wonderful that they are willing to do that for the sake of the gathered church. Yeah. You know, it was a wonderful time. Yeah. And, and the cost of getting baptised that day, right? Totally. They got baptised outside, freezing cold yes. water, the you know, yeah, shock yeah. as they came up again. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and in that too, Gareth Kearney and his family, they were chucking in urn after urn of boiling water <laughs> to try and take the edge off, but I don't think it, I don't no. think it worked. I did have, Robert said it was warmer than the ocean. So. Which is a win, yeah. right? You know? But those, like, those moments are just so precious. And that, I remember in that room that day, there was just a sense of, with with family, yeah. you know, we're all from here. We're all we're yeah. all. It's in some ways it's so hard to explain, but it's just there's something different about mm. it. Yeah. And, and West, um, the lovely West, you know, gathering in that old Beauchamp Street Chapel. Mm. The past couple of weeks, what I've been celebrating is I'm hearing from a, I've heard from a few different people. There's just a next step in worship, yeah. in, wow. the, in in the presence of God in that place with such a stripped back mode of doing worship yeah joe costa toby jackson helen musson have just done an amazing job leading uh, that gathering in such a humble gentle just god focused way where mm. all they want is him mm. yeah. and it's just it's impacting people which is amazing wow. and yeah oh man i could go on for ages but 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 even seeing needs where where needs may not have been met before or mm. seen before one of our gatherings group of people banded together just to, to bless a family going through a rough time mm. just with some financial support um, saw a need and, and, and met it yeah. it's yeah. beautiful amazing yeah and so you've seen the sort of up in worship and the, mm. and the in and community are we seeing the out as well yeah 100% and, and for us you know, we've, I hope we've communicated that well, but we've talked about it a lot, is that that's the, one of the main reasons is we yeah. want to be out yeah. meeting that need. But I think we've also said that in order for that to happen well, we need to have a strong group of people meeting that sense of identity. Mm. Yeah, great. And, and what I'm celebrating now is, again, that similar to the phrase I've heard before around people feeling connected, what I'm also hearing is people going, man, I have so much more of a burden for mm. my community. Mm. Yeah. Like it's a, not a sense of just, oh, I live here, but wow, this is, this is my community. Yeah. I love this place. Yeah. And they've got their heads up and they're looking out, man, what are the needs? You know, we had a, a, a prayer meeting in Karori a few weeks ago and it was supposed to be about the gathering and efficiency and how we improve things, mm. but it just quickly turned into, man, what's going on in Karori? Yeah. How do we bless this place? Nice. And so... That's, that's where we want to go, um, and I see that a really positive step in that deep sense of empathy. You know, when you, we look at Jesus, when he looked at Jerusalem, he wept. He could see what the city needed, mm. and I think that's the first step that we're seeing now as people across our gatherings going, man, oh, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling something, you know, and that's, mm. that's something I'm celebrating Amazing. for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. Mm. Jeremy, so many uh, good stories, and yet it's also fair to say that there's a there's some real tension um, in this new way of gathering. I know some mm. of us are missing friends that we used to see every week, and and that children don't always get to gather in sort mm. of a large peer group like they might have, might have done at some point at, at, at City. We really want to hear you to hear today that we're experiencing those challenges too, and we do understand. Mm. Yeah, we also want to say thank you so much to everyone who has entered the dialogue and given feedback to us over mm. the past months. Your feedback is helping shape where we're heading and we'd love to hear from more of you as this discernment process continues. Yeah. Um, if, you've got, if you've got comments that you'd like to make, please email city at the street.org.nz or get in touch with your lead pastor. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So where are we going from here? Yeah. <laughs> it's a question, right? We said that we would use 2022 to discern whether these local services should become permanent, full locations mm. of the street. Mm. You know, we spent time talking together and seeking God for the best way forward. That's what we're looking for, the best yeah. way forward. And recently, we feel like uh, we've made progress um, on this next step. And together with the elders, we've agreed that one of the things we want to characterize our church going forward yeah. is to be a church that is locally present. Mm. This means our goal is we are present throughout Wellington, making the community of the church accessible and welcoming to anyone. 
Our gatherings, both small and large, are vibrant and faith-filled. On the one hand, this is not much of an announcement. Right. We embarked on a multi-site strategy a long time ago, mm. and it's fair to say that progress stalled once Eastern Night were launched. This recent step reaffirms the sense of call that we have had before. Mm. And however, it is also a bit more than this. You know, we've said that it's sort of not an announcement in some ways, and yet it also is. We're saying that we believe the Lord is leading us to have locations in these new areas and potentially in the northern suburbs as well. Mm. These groups are going from strength to strength, and it's true that we need to keep learning together. It therefore means that the question is not if we want to head in this direction, but how and whether it's even possible. The reality is we don't have a long line of ready and willing lead pastors to step into the leadership of a location that looks the same as East and Night and City have looked. Nevertheless, in these local services, we're seeing glimpses of what's possible. You heard it in Jerem's stories. And there seems to be some momentum around them, people willing to turn up, you know, in the middle of winter and keep doing the same thing. And so what we therefore now need to work on is to understand the nature of leadership that we could put in place that would enable these services to become fully fledged locations. And so the discernment process we said we were on this year is continuing, but it also enters right now a new stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's our next step? Mm -hmm. Well, we've got some ideas of what that leadership could look like, and we now need to work closely with the local leaders and their teams at each of the services to make sure that we've understood the issues and whether our ideas could actually work in practice. I know you may have questions coming out of this. Tomorrow, we'll be sending an email to the whole of the street with an FAQs document that Jerem has put together. Um, if your question isn't answered in that document, talk to your lead pastor or you can get in touch at city at the street .org .nz and we'll be able to help you. Mm -hmm. But we'll also make sure we give more regular updates as we continue to move through 2022. Yeah, it's fair to say, I think we've missed that up until now, so we just wanted to try and correct that uh, from here on. But for now, can I encourage you seriously to pray about this? I don't say that loosely or because it's just token. I really, mm -hmm. really mean it. We believe God is continuing to call us to be strong and courageous, to trust that even though we don't know what the future holds, that He does. Mm -hmm. We need Him to continue to open doors and make a way for us. Uh, as we seek to fulfill the mission that he's given us yeah. as a church in the particular way we feel he's calling us to do that right now. Wow, so cool to watch that. Um, so cool to have an update from Simon, Jenny and Jerem. Mm. Um, if you have any questions about that or any encouragements to send through, then just um, email city at the street dot org. Yeah, dot dot NZ. NZ. Email that email, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so awesome gathering together. I so want to encourage you, if you are watching this at home and you've been watching it um, like by yourself for a while, I always so encourage you to um, get connected with others. Mm. And how you can do that is email online at thestreet.org.nz and we'd love to invite you along to one of our gatherings that meet all across the city um, and get to know you more, hear your story and welcome you to be part of the family. So, yeah, mm. it's been an awesome gathering today. So cool. And have a great week. See ya. Bye.